this is a new series of uh, webinars that the Mind Science Center is organizing, uh, focused on mental health, um, and not only for elderly, but also for youth. Um, and I'm very glad that this is the support from um, the Renhai Center, and the chairperson is Professor Hong Hai. And there are three parts to this uh, webinar. But firstly, we'll show you some of the research that we're doing at the, web, at the uh, Mind Science Center, and followed by the discussion with the panel. And the third part is the question and answers. So Maureen, can you first show them the slides? Um, so, okay, um, can we have the first, next one, please? And this is a very important, like uh, the, the probably the first paper published in the world on the natural history of dementia so if you can see that um on the slide there are three parts of dementia can you get back again um maureen the next one get back to the earlier slide please right you see in this slide there are three phases on dementia a mild moderate and severe and um the mild phase is about um six six years moderate is about three years and severe about three years and if you're able to do a lot of things to help your your relatives the mouth phase may extend beyond six years i look after a surgeon and the mouth phase went on for about 10 years and with good quality of life so there are many things that can be done to improve the quality of life of people at the mild phase and often it's when in this moderate phase when they are a bit more disturbed that you see that the, the caregivers are on the under a bit of stress especially uh, with sleep problem that even into anxiety and depression next slide please um, right so this is a study is published a long time ago part of the world health study on family caregivers and published in the international journals and we found that in the NUH memory clinic, 45% uh, of caregivers have anxiety, depression, um, and associated with delusions of the patient, delusion that people are stealing their things because they misplaced their, their, their purse or their even their watches. You know. uh, sometimes in the evening, they have, they have hallucination that's very disturbing. And thirdly, they also become a bit more restless, agitated, and because of the wandering behavior, it caused a lot of stress to the caregivers. And these are all in the, um, the, the moderate phase of the illness. And there are many things we can be done to reduce this kind of um, symptoms. Next slide, please. So it's, it's, we find that in the, as a doctor, it is not just to tell people what the problems, more important, how can you resolve the problems? So we did a study on intervention for the caregivers. Uh, first one group, we gave them a, a book called Healthcare in Old Age, which was published almost 25 years ago by the um, Gerontological Society, the first book published by the society. And in fact, the, the, the chairperson of the society today is uh, Professor uh, Tang Leng Leng, I'm going to speak later on. And the second thing we did was telephone counseling and thirdly, a monthly support group. So of all these three, um, the, the particular activity that they find most helpful is in fact, telephone counseling. You know, a book is helpful, they know something about dementia, they know something about services, but they say that telephone counseling is, is much better. The monthly support group is, is good, but we can only organize it once a month because of, we, we didn't have much uh, time for or to help to run the, the, the monthly group. So uh, that's too, too infrequent. Um, next slide, please. Uh, one my last one. And so, um, can you, yes, sir. So during the time of SARS, about 20 years ago, uh, when all the services were very much crippled, we thought of com comparing two, you know, whether, whether we can do telephone counseling and compare with e-counseling using the computers, you know, email counseling. And, and we found that once again, is telephone counseling. So it's, it's the sound of a human voice that, that the caregivers prefer. So you see an old contraption 
invented more than 150 years ago by Alexander Graham Bell, is still very useful to reduce the stress of caregivers. Okay, now I'll introduce our, our, our four panelists. Um, the first is um, Professor Tan Ting Wee, he is the Professor of Biochemistry, previously the head department, but now he's in charge of the uh, supercomputers here in Singapore. He'll talk about his experience. The second is um, Ms. Lily Fu. Oh, oh, I've got uh, Ms. Lily Fu. Um, she is in charge of the um, seniors allowed, uh, she's in charge of block in KL and is speaking from KL, but was previously here in Singapore, did a master's program in gerontology from NTU. Uh, Ms. Vice President of the um, and the third person we have here is Professor Tang Leng Leng, who is the head of the uh, Japanese studies in NUS and also the president of the Gerontological Society. And the, the fourth person uh, is Mr. Daniel Lim. Daniel is a wonderful person. He's set up uh, Enable Asia and it, full of uh, innovative ideas. Even a book published recently, and they will share. And all the four will share with us. The experiences in the in caring for someone in a family with dementia. I'll start first start off with uh, Professor Tan Ting Wee. Ting Wee, can you tell us your experience? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, and and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, sometimes you know, ill fortune comes all bunched up in one row, and don't they? And these are tough situations that uh, we have to go through. And at that time, uh, my wife passed away, a single parent. My kids are still in school, was, was still in school then. And at the same time, my dad came down with a, 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 a lot of uh, um, situations uh, related to his dementia, a worsening dementia condition. Then he had stomach bleeding. And then uh, my mom also started to display symptoms. And um, my sister had to take uh, early retirement and I had to keep on my job and, <laughs> and uh, be a sole breadwinner. So, so essentially, uh, and then my father-in-law came down with a, a medical condition at the same time. So it, it's a flood of active events that take place that really makes things really difficult for us. And uh, I, I was uh, very fortunate that I was able to um, uh, uh, seek the support of uh, many friends and, uh, and and I managed to be inducted into the NAMAS group, study group. I see many of them here to support us. This is the nature and mindful awareness uh, study group that uh, Professor Kwai uh, uh, runs. And uh, they have been a, a, a tremendous blessing to me in, in keeping me maintain my sanity. So it's this kind of uh, a, a community uh, a help and support and a network of people that you can uh, rely on and uh, and for sure, I alone could not have coped with that uh, coped uh, with that episode, and I almost could have gone insane. Um, but I think it takes a whole family, it takes a whole community, and, and that also includes our domestic helpers uh, to come together and and find ways to support each other. And I'm really grateful that my sister uh, and I we work fairly well together. Um, the worst is when family members, you know, uh, disagree over how. Um, um, how to care for our loved ones. And, and, and I take my hat off to my sister who, who, who visits my mom almost every day huh? uh, while my dad is now uh, in a nursing home. And of course, our domestic helper who always are at the front line um, when we are not around. So I think for our, looking after our loved ones, I really take my hat off to those who single-handedly uh, manage their loved ones with dementia. Uh, because it really takes uh, um, you know, multiple people in order to uh, get the job properly done. And I know that there are many of the people out there who are single-handedly trying to do this. Um, and, and, and I know that because I volunteer with the Caregivers Alliance as an assistant trainer. And, um, and, and I listen to all the students that take part in, that, uh, in the regular workshops that we have. And I've already done three, three of these eight week courses and I listen to all their stories, you know, and, and, and it always brings tears to my eyes. And week after week, they come and, and, and share and, and create that network of support. So my story again, it, my, 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 it comes to is, it, we need to come together in order to help every single person that has dementia needs uh, more than one person to help. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tingwi. Um, I know Tingwi went through a very difficult time um, 
and he, he joins our Saturday um, morning walk and there are a lot of ladies in the group who are very supportive of him. I know listening is I, Mrs. Eileen uh, Bygrave and Eileen will, will, will make some lasagna for him, you know, how oh, oh, wonderful, you got, you got caregiver, friends who are helping out, you know, and, and, um, and, and he'll tell them about the difficult times and people will, will see how they can help out. Uh, so a support group is very important in, in how you can bring your family together. And I know the, the families in Singapore, because of the dementia uh, person, there were a lot of problems that even they go to court, you know, you know, with the, over these issues of caring. You know. um, so sh shall we move on to the next person uh, up north in Kuala Lumpur? Dili, you've looked after your mother for many years now, and you have many things to, to help us out or, or to show us how to care for someone with, uh, with uh, all grace and, and dignity. All right, Dili. Uh, thank you, Prof. I just don't know where to start. Uh, probably 19, late 1990s, my mother from Batupaha, she came up to live with me and my sister. So it was easy uh, in the early years because I had somebody there with me, my sister. So both of us looked after our mom. And of course, at that time, I think in the late 1990s, not much was known about dementia and Alzheimer's. I, for one, didn't know anything about it. Then what happened was my sister passed away in 2006. So that left me and my mom, just the two of us uh, together. And then one day I was away for a workshop in Johor Bahru. And when I came home, I found my mother lying on the, on the floor and uh, in the pool of uh, you know, urine. So I asked her, mom, what are you doing down there? She said, am I, am I lying down here? So that gave me kind of an indication that something was wrong. Perhaps she could have uh, you know, knocked her head when she fell. So we took her to the hospital and then that was the beginning of her hospitalization, the post-surgery and all that went along with it, which was so new to me at that time. It was like a, you know, like a, you know, like a shock. I'm sure, you know, <laughs> Prof Tan will also be familiar with, maybe more familiar than I was because I totally didn't know anything about, you know, Alzheimer's at the point. Uh, so while she was uh, in the hospital, one of the doctors told me he said, I think your mother has early signs of uh, some signs of dementia. Perhaps you could get her uh, seen by a geriatrician. So that was the first time I took her to the hospital later to see the geriatrician. She went through a battery of tests and so on. It just confirmed that she had uh, Alzheimer's. So then came the caregiving part. And as uh, Prof Tan has already mentioned, it's really a challenge. And I found now there was no playbook on anything on how to care for a dementia uh, elderly who is in hospital. Meaning to say that when she was in hospital, of course she had surgery, she had uh, diapers and all that. And all the time she was screaming and yelling. She wanted to go to the toilet. She wanted to go to the bathroom. And we told her, you just had surgery. She had hip surgery. And there's no way you could get down and make your way to the, the, the toilet. But she refused to you know, accept that. She kept on yelling and screaming and causing a lot of confusion in the ward. So that was something very, very challenging. So in the end, what happened was, uh, just to share, um, because she made so much noise, screaming and yelling and all that, they had to tie her down. And for a daughter or for any family member to go and visit and see your mother being tied down, right, hands and feet, it is really, it, it, I don't know how to describe it. And then at night, because she was screaming and yelling so much and disturbing the other uh, patients, the, the nurses had to push her bed to the pantry. So these are the challenges that I don't find in any playbook and what to do about that, right? That was very early on. Oh, in the it. mic was supposed to be off. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so um, yeah, th that was my experience. I think the years have passed and I find that now there's so much more that we can look up, that can, we can do research on, so much more support for caregivers especially. I think, you know, if you're a primary caregiver or even worse, the sole caregiver, it is very tough. For me, it was a relief in the sense that I had already retired by then. So I had more time, but still being alone, right? With uh, my mother, for example, means it is difficult. 
The additional uh, problem also was that after the hospitalization, I wasn't able to bring her back home. The reason being, and this is something also for uh, the young people to consider, I live in an apartment where there are no lifts. So it's a walk up, it's a low rise walk up. I couldn't bring her back. Even if I did, she would be kind of like, you know, like a prisoner at home, not able to go anywhere because we had no lift at all. But that is, uh, you know, one of the biggest challenge for those, right, um, you know, to think about. And I think um, as far as uh, what Prof Hua said earlier regarding uh, e-telephone uh, counseling and all that, yes, I find that that's pretty useful. And I would like to add one more thing. I think there's also what they call video, video as well. Because in the early stages, uh, post-surgery, post-rehabilitation time, I was supposed to uh, take my mother to see the geriatrician every time the pills ran out, right? And it was not easy, very challenging to bring her in a wheelchair to the hospital and I don't drive, right? So later on, after months of doing this, I finally asked uh, the uh, doctor, is it okay if I just videotape my mom so that you will have an idea right, what, uh, she, how she's doing and so forth. So I'll, that's what I did. I sent him video recordings of my mother maybe eating or my mother sleeping, or my mother doing various things. And that helped a lot. And I would go personally to explain to him as well. So just to share that bit, maybe later on some more. <laughs> Back to you. Thank you, uh, Lily. Um, certainly now because of the pandemic, uh, most of my patients, we do video conferencing. So uh, I'll, I'll yeah, just directly to the home. It's very difficult for them to come to the clinics now. In fact, we forbid seniors from coming to the hospital. So we just do video conferencing. Um, but also, the, the, I would like to let all of you know that dementia is not a terminal illness. It's a chronic illness. Mm -hmm. So um, people get very frightened by it. So you see, um, what Lily mentioned to you was that she was shocked when they first heard about this dementia. So we're, we're trying to rethink uh, the whole process of an illness like, like dementia or even cancer. You know? And uh, the medical students been told or the nurses been told, I'm sure Lily, when you're studying NTU, they were told that their faces of, when of this illness, people will say it's a phase of denial, a phase of bargaining, but that's Kluber Ross's idea, you know. But, I find that most people are a face of shock, you know, and then fear, anxiety, what's all about. So I think it's very good for people, for the low people in Singapore, even Asia, to think about the various phases of illnesses you know, and so that we know how to cope with it, you know, because they're always saying that, oh, there's a denial, there's a bargaining, there is an a anger, then there's acceptance. No, that's just the textbook stuff, you know, things change. So I think um, what she's mentioning also that education, uh, information is very important. Many people don't know very much about dementia. So a webinar like this is, in, and all of you uh, uh, discussing your, your experiences, people will, will sort of, uh, it will dovetail with, with what they have in, in their experience, you know. And I, I find that it's, um, for someone like uh, Professor Tan Ting Hui, it's, it's not too difficult because he's so educated, he knows where to look for it. Uh, so what happened is someone was to live in the um, in the uh, heartlanders, uh, the working class people who have, who are not that tech savvy, and where do they get information from? This is a, a great challenge to to all of us, and 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 often like even listening to this this webinar, the people who are fairly well educated coming, a lot of people who may not reach us in, in that way. I was wondering, I was thinking that your mother was in Batu Pahad. I want to ask you a question. Is it better to look after a dementia person in a small town like Batu Pahad or a big city like KL or Singapore? You know, uh, we'll go to that later on. You can answer now, Lily. Is it easier to, to manage? I think it's easier if she's with me. In a small town in Batu no, Pahad? No, 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 like really? up here in KL because the facilities okay, are right. better, I think. Okay. The good point about big cities like what... Uh, Professor Tan Ting, we mentioned is that we have the, all this organization, the Caregivers Alliance, and all these things are on the big cities. We're hoping that if you people in the small towns and all that, they can also start off some of this, of this kind of a, a voluntary organization that can help out. Okay. Um, 
now we'll move on to Professor Tan Ling Ling. Ling Ling, you want to discuss with us um, your experience? Hi, hi, I'm Ling Ling here. Um, actually, Prof Kwa, I stepped down as head of department from last July, and uh, I'm involved now with uh, as a colleague of uh, the longevity um, stream in the health district at Queenstown. So uh, I think I am more fortunate than um, you know Lily in the sense that because uh, I, um, as a researcher, I've already done research on caregiving. Um, but of course, it's very different, right? When um, you, you know, we are the one that's, you know, um, have to face the, the, the shock, as you say, in terms of uh, when you hear that your own loved ones um, have dementia. So uh, yeah, when that happened to my father, who is um, uh, in the mid eighties, and by now he has been diagnosed for almost 18 months. And the doctors say that, you know, he's already entering into the severe stage. Although I do, we, I do feel that maybe he's getting more stabilized. Um, yeah, so, so in any way, I want to thank the caregivers that I, I uh, make friends with from my interviews, my, my, my research, and they have really been angels helping me um, to cope with, um, you know, a telephone away for me to ask for help. So I think um, I'm very fortunate in that sense. But of course, like any other caregivers of the dementia loved ones, we meet you know, many typical difficult situations, like get, you know, you get agitated and shouted, you know, sun, sundown syndrome and so on. But for me, as uh, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm the prime, I'm, I mean, in a sense the primary because, you know, it's a teamwork for caregiving. But I think the most difficult thing is not about caring for my dad, but communicating with my mother who is actually the primary caregiver. Um, you know, in Singapore, we all really think of caregiving of, um, of older parents as a teamwork, including the spouse, if um, he or she can care, um, adult children and also domestic helpers at home. So my mom and my 82 year old, my mom is 82 year old um, and living with my dad alone. So this is also quite a typical living arrangement now in Singapore. My mom is healthy, uh, have no helpers except for a part-time help. So she's not used to having full-time helper with her. So when my, my dad became immobile and needing ADL help, um, we had a very tense family discussion. Like, you know, people were like, you know, my mom was really agitated, was, you know, shouting as well, that um, her first reaction was uh, she wanted to send my dad to the nursing home. And that can be understandable because, you know, she's alone. She... She couldn't care for him alone. And then we, all the children, the three of us are still working. So we cannot be full-time caregivers. So, um, but of course, you know, for, for us siblings, we feel that, oh, we should get um, a domestic helper because it's the most common practice, most viable solution in Singapore. Um, so we, so the long and short is, it, is that uh, we do have a um, domestic helper that came in and then you know it was so difficult to try to get someone right during COVID time uh, when it was shut down and, and all that so um, uh, the first helper came directly from Indonesia um, not do not have much experience with caregiving but uh, to me she's she's okay she has the heart for it but my mom had problem with her because of language issues because of other mismatches you know a lot of small little things that means mismatches so that was actually the most difficult time for me because we needed someone to help and we needed someone that's suitable to help. And, you know, but this is not suitable. So my mom was very stressed. The, the helper was also very stressed and you not know, calling me to say she wants to leave. And then uh, when my mom, my father started to have sundown syndrome, uh, three months later, the situation was almost out of control. So anyway, in the eight months, we, we had three change of um, helpers for the daytime care. Uh, the third one is the finally okay now because I think partly because my mom came to realize you know, there's no perfect mate, right? You need to really know that uh, what we want for our helper is someone who is able to take good care of our father. So, um, so when my dad's sundown syndrome became challenging, then we had to engage a local caregiver uh, to come every night from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. for a month before we found a suitable um, domestic helper that could do the night shift on a permanent basis. So this second helper that we have is from Myanmar, who is a transfer helper, and, and she's just got sent. You know, she's really professional, patient, speaks very fluent Mandarin. So um, 
I think I, I would end with some observation as an adult child involved with care. I think first, you know, it's really important to stay together or very close by. I think that's very important. It's very fortunate like my parents moved to live very close to me, like 100 meters away, about four years ago. So now I can easily be around to help anytime because, you know, it's just really popping over. And I wish that we had planned better for my other siblings to also move to stay close by. Then also, I mean, as we all talk about and we are all aware that it's very important to have a good network of care. And, um, and I feel that as adult children, you know, because we are so focused on my father, sometimes we forgot my, my mother, who is the, you know, base, the, the primary caregiver and who is very stressed out as well, that she needs a lot of support. She needs time off to respite and, and, and so forth. And we also shouldn't forget the domestic helpers because they are really, you know, like what Prof Tan say, the first line of help the, 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 in the forefront of providing the essential care. And we also need to um, not, you know, that they won't get burned out as well and they need time off. And then lastly, I think um, it's very common that when things happen, we tend to focus a lot on physical care. Then we overlook the emotional needs, the need for communication, right, with persons with dementia. So through my dad, I learned that, you know, persons with dementia is not like they don't, they, it's not like they lose capacity to think. It's just that their memories became fragmented. And then they find it very hard to hold a conversation because of that. So my dad, you know, I'll say to have entered the severe stage, um, he's talking really very much less now and spends a lot of time, he's always closing his eyes and we always have the time, please open your eyes, you know, and talk to us. Um, but at good times, at certain, you know, very minimal time, but he still displays a sense of humor that he used to be, which delights all of us. So I, I hope that, you know, I just end with a positive note, hoping that we will all find this such small moments of joy with our loved ones, regardless of, of the challenges out there. Thank you. Thank you, Ling Ling. I think it's um, very challenging, uh, the caring for someone. And, and I noticed the same thing, even in, in the hospitals when we employ nurses in the um, Unfortunately, we not many Singapore nurses on the work in the hospitals in the for in the geriatric ward, and we often have to have uh, nurses that come from elsewhere, uh, uh, Philippines, Myanmar, and they have difficulty in communicating with our, our patients. You know? um, so it's the same as you have, you have a domestic helper at home, and uh, this adds up to the issues that the difficulties in caring when they cannot communicate, and sometimes social suspicion. And it's unfortunate because sometimes when they misplace things, they'll say, oh, the, the domestic helper has stolen my, my money, my wallet, my watches. I know one case in which they changed the domestic helper three times, you know, you know uh, uh, within a short period of six months. You know? So these are some of the issues that we uh, encounter here. Um, maybe during the, the Q&A, uh, some people can tell us how they can resolve this kind of issue of language. You know? um, but your, your dad seemed to move on very fast and from, from moderate to severe, the, the, the yes. time. Yeah, the geriatrician say it's like, uh, she, she says it's about three years and my dad is halfway through now. That's what he, she says, like, you know, which means it's like one and a half years already. So, but I mean, to me, I think he seems more settled, you know, now <clears throat> than before, because before that, maybe we were all in confusion as well. So we find it very difficult. But now because things are meant more settled in uh, with the care arrangements and all that, and then we managed to bring him to uh, the community rehab as well, um, the, in the, that we can just wheel him over you know, in 20 minutes. So I think uh, with that kind of community network help, I think it's important, very important for us to feel that, um, you know, to stabilize his everyday life. Yeah. That's right. I think, um... If you tap on uh, Tingwi's uh, the the Care Alliance group, <laughs> uh, no. not not that. Uh, but we because near my house is the Guang Wai Xiu Services, which okay. is pretty good. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let us move on to Mr. Daniel Lim. Uh, Daniel looking after two very frail parents, and he's wonderful. Besides that, he's running a big. Uh, um, is it NGO? We call it. Um, Enable Asia and they hold yeah. a festival once a year. And I, and I hope you, all of you will participate in this, in this festival. It's often in October. 
So Daniel, you want to share with us your experience? Yeah. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. So thank you for the opportunity to, to share uh, and to begin with, because um, my journey really started back in 2009. Uh, I was barely 29 at that time, right? And in and, and October 2009, uh, we went to send mummy for, 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 for an annual checkup, right? Oh, mummy got cancer, right? And back to back in a single month, daddy has early uh, dementia, right? Uh, it's not an early onset, but it's at the very start of a mild stage dementia. So fast forward that 13 years, uh, both of them are still around. Uh, they're both elderly li living with frailty at this point in time. And daddy is still uh, moving from only the 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 mild stage to the uh, moderate stage, right? So that journey took 13 years. And really the magic is actually to, to, to talk about how to maintain them at, uh, at, that, at that high cognitive ability for as long as we can before, before things start to deteriorate. Because when they deteriorate, uh, it goes into a very sharp uh, drop, right? So uh, as, a, as a product of a population policy, I was a single child uh, and a single child that needs to take care of two elderly parents. Never easy. At 29, no information was available back then in 2009. There wasn't support groups available at, this, at that point in time. Um, conversation wasn't in dementia. It was always in Alzheimer's. Um, only recently, I think the conversation expanded to umbrella of dementia. Well, at that point in time, your personal trajectory in life has to change, right? Well, everybody else around you is talking about getting a better job, scaling in their careers, having a home, starting a family. Yours was about caregiving, right? How much do you know about diapers after getting out of it 20 years before that, right? So at 29 years old, you're thinking, hey, what do I know about caregiving? I know nothing. So a lot of it was because uh, why we are here today is because of the support that what uh, Ting Lin's mentioned. A lot of it has been community. Because of the ability to stay here for the last 40 years, uh, we built a community of uh, 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 neighbors that cared for our family. Because in my saying, right, the saying goes is that if I have a a, a neighbor who can come to my aid is faster and quicker than my relative who's staying uh, maybe three kilometers down the road, right? Because my neighbors is just 10 steps across. So we're very thankful to, 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 to my neighbors. I won't put it on record because some of them are here as well, uh, that you have been a pillar of my strength because 40 years here and you're the ones next door. So, so we really thank you because they come forward and say, why don't we start a WhatsApp block chat? And today we are proud to have 100 families onto our block, blocks, blocks WhatsApp chat that says that when daddy runs around and get lost, they are the ones who help me find them. I mean, I mean, I know apps and all that stuff, the tracker and all that works, but it's never the, 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 the you take away that human touch, I think the, the impossible, and you add in that human touch, I think the impossible happens. So, so that also allows us to come out and speak up and stand up and speak up to tell our community that, yeah, we are, we are family living with certain situations. Uh, if you hear daddy screaming in the middle of the night, please don't call the police. Please text me and say, is everything, happen is everything okay at home, right? If you hear banging of the tables, if you hear breaking of the dishes, it's, it's normal, right? So, so, so that allows me to educate uh, um, my community uh, all the way right up to the barber who, 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 who shaves daddy's hair, right? Because when you look good, you feel good, right? Because then we won't have any hygiene issues because every time he goes to the barber, he automatically goes in and shower, right? So... So really, to be very candid about it, uh, 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 fast forward at 13 years, uh, Cal was a part of my uh, uh, recovery uh, uh, journey because I was part of the first batch of the Dementia to Dementia Caregivers Program, uh, as what Tingui has mentioned. Uh, I think today, they are a part of my pillars because most of them end up uh, at the social enterprise with me, uh, helping to, 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 to care for persons living with dementia, as well as caregivers, right? Uh, as what Ling Ling mentioned as well, the part of the caregivers piece has been missing for a long, many, many years because Nobody really understands the journey that we go through, uh, the biopsychosocial interventions that uh, we administer for our loved ones. We, don't, we ourselves think that that's the right thing to do, but we never, 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 often never ask our loved ones, is this what they like to be done to them? So I'll give you a very typical example, right? I'll stop at this, uh, and then we'll continue our conversations later on. In a diaper situation during COVID, right? So Daddy had uh, uh, public incontinence and started developing that during COVID. And I said, Papa, can we, can we put you in diapers though we're at home, right? And then he, in his very lucid moment, he says that, why don't you and I as adults put on our adult diapers together, you Zoom and do your meetings one whole day. And he sits there and he watches TVs and plays games and do all that stuff one whole day, right? And after that day, I came up to him and said, Papa, I understand what you're saying to me. Uh, I'll never put you in a diaper as, as for as long as possible because I can't do it. <laughs> so, so to give you that dignity and to give you that respect, uh, I said, hey, actually, you inform me of how I can better care for you 
uh, as long as you can tell me that, or as long as you can find a way to communicate with me uh, on how that's to be done, uh, I think I can do it. So now when we go out, we bring extra diaper, we bring extra clothing, we bring extra underwear, we bring extra shoes, we bring extra socks. It's just like we're preparing for go for a trip, right? But what it means is that it is still possible. So I want to end on that note and pass it back to Prof um, to talk a little bit more about that. But the advocacy piece, we'll leave it for later. Thank you, Daniel. Um, what Daniel mentioned about informing your neighbors is something very, very important, you know, and let them know. Uh, and I often tell my also the other patients, you have to tell your neighbors, they may be very helpful to you. And sometimes you need a break, they come in to help out. And, and But people sometimes are very embarrassed by it. You know, get, if I have a, a father or mother with dementia, you know, the stigma involved in it. Is, is, and, and so don't be afraid to tell people about that. They are more eager to help you out. And I know in, in the community in Singapore, we are trying to build up within the, the the precinct where you're living, uh, uh, whether this kind of support group can be very helpful. Um, last week, HDB people uh, spoke to me, they're trying to do something at Queenstown, uh, and they asked whether we can do something on the uh, the therapeutic garden. You know, So they mentioned that some of the gardens we organized are very good, we've done some research, uh, but it's quite far away. Can people just go down from their block to the therapeutic garden? And something for people, even for dementia, how can they uh, um, navigate to these areas and, and something helpful for them? And the community can also come together and say, that, oh, this person has dementia. Well, it's okay. Uh, it's a chronic illness but it's, um, and it's a bit uh, restless, agitated. As Daniel mentioned, it's understandable and people able to uh, become more enlightened by this kind of intervention. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, I want to uh, open up for q and A. I know someone asked whether attending this seminar, she can get a certificate, and we don't have a certificate for that. <laughs> Sorry for that. Um, and someone asked whether there's something on prevention. Um, I think we, we um, if you go to the website of the um, Mind Science Center, the big thrust of the research is on dementia prevention. And uh, there's a talk coming out on the 8th of May and, and we'll sort of give you an overall uh, picture of the, the, the scene here in Singapore. Um, now, any one of you, any question to each other? Um, four of them are, four of you are wonderful uh, role models for caregiving, you know, when a difficult time. Um, what is it about you, Tan Tin that you're able to survive, you know, you know it's just the resilient person in you, you know? Anything you can share with them that, you know, Caregiving, what is it, the resilience in you? Well, as I said, uh, it's actually um, the community around us, our friends. For example, yourself, uh, <laughs> you pulled me into this, uh, uh, doing things uh, uh, um, um, that you know, engage ourselves in, in, in doing positive things and then provide that sometimes you know, very subtle support, you know, like Lasagna from uh, Aileen, <laughs> who's here in the audience. All right. Yeah. So these are little things that you can do for caregivers that actually uh, makes a world of difference for them. And I, I just want to emphasize that um, uh, um, the community must be able to recognize people who are caregivers and, and you know, a word of uh, positive word here and there uh, goes a long way uh, to really uh, help us uh, change our mindset and get out of the rut. Um, there's also a lot to be said about the guilt that uh, caregivers uh, face. And so any comment that you pass to caregivers that might drag them down further into and, and get mired in, in that uh, fatal loop of guilt uh, um, uh, it does not really help at all. So uh, one has to be pretty careful about when, when, when passing comment, comments about, oh, you should do this or you should do that or you should have done this or you should have done that. Um, I, I believe that in many cases, um, our loved ones with dementia are, are quite different and in many cases unique, but not unique to the point where there are not certain commonalities that we can uh, put into training programs and, and, and to uh, 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 create that level of a deeper level of awareness, uh, not just amongst caregivers, uh, but in the healthcare profession as well, as well as um, uh, uh, the community at large. As I shared uh, in the one of those sessions, you know, I think uh, uh, healthcare professionals and caregivers must come together in a partnership, 
it cannot be, you know, the healthcare professionals, yeah, you go back and go figure out how to fix it. I just prescribe the drugs and occasionally I watch the video clip of, 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 your, of my patient. It has to come together and, and, and not just caregivers alone, but the community as well. So this, this kind of tripartite arrangement, I, I feel is lacking, uh, especially in Singapore. And uh, this comes, starts from caregivers education. And it's quite, can be quite shocking uh, to see that professionally trained nurses, nursing matrons and so on, uh, having a proper conversation with my dad when you immediately see the disconnect. He is in a state of dementia and you are having a logical conversation with him. And this disconnect is like, wow, you mean a nurse, a professional does not understand how to interact with a, uh, with a person in a, in a dementia episode? So it's these shocking things that I've discovered that, uh, which is why I, I made an effort to uh, volunteer with, uh, with uh, the Caregivers Alliance uh, to join their assistant trainership and, 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 and train. I've gone to three batches of students already. And the more I listen to people, the more I teach, the more I learn. And the more shocking it becomes that, uh, that, that there's a huge gap uh, that, that we need to address uh, as a community, as a society. And that comes from uh, all the groups of people are coming together. I did share about uh, caregivers education. Um, and, and, but I also want to emphasize that almost everyone, unless you live in a mountain all by yourself, huh, is a caregiver or a caregiver to be. And with the, the, the statistics that we see to get today, it is almost inevitable that almost all of us will become uh, caregivers one day. And therefore, there needs to be a concerted effort right now. Uh, it's never too late. And right now, there has to be a movement to create caregiver preparedness. Uh, just as we have pandemic pre preparedness, we need to start addressing this issue about preparing ourselves to be caregivers. And I cannot emphasize this enough uh, because I've seen many uh, sad situations emerge because we're simply just not prepared to recognize a situation that we can address and prevent or delay the onset of uh, symptoms and debilitating symptoms of dementia. And the, the more prepared we are, the, the earlier we can recognize the symptoms, the earlier we can seek intervention, the earlier we can prepare uh, for uh, a, a much smoother process in the caregiving uh, of our loved ones. Thank you. Thanks, Tingui. I think uh, maybe you should start much earlier, Tingui, that maybe we should, we should measure the, 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 the three medical schools that they should teach the soft skills to the medical students and also the nurses on how to deal with people L people in general and people with dementia in particular, no? oh, and and the, and you mentioned about the uh, coming together community and the healthcare. You should uh, suggest to the um, to the prime minister in waiting, Mr. Lawrence Wong, this will be something higher on his agenda when he's about to start off his new job. Man, think about community care. Okay. All of us be caregivers, you know. All right, okay. Think we there's a question for the uh, Mr. Lawrence Wong. If he, if he comes to your office, this is the thing you should think about. You know? All right. Lily, do you think that there's some positive part of it, uh, the uplifting part in caring for your mother over the years? Well, of course, the first thing is, you know, you, you learn, uh, you pick up, you know, some uh, strategies and all that for yourself, <laughs> for the future. And what worries me actually is that uh, once I knew more about uh, dementia and Alzheimer's, I discovered that quite a number of my own relatives, among the women folk especially, quite a few of them, uh, have been, uh, what do you call it, diagnosed. Huh? And I kind of wonder whether it will be me, my turn next. So that's kind of a worrying uh, thought. But, but listening to uh, Daniel earlier, I fully agree with Daniel where it comes to community because sometimes our neighbours are there. Our neighbours are the closest to us, not so much our family because our family could be in another town, you know, even another country. So here in Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur, I've been trying my very best to revive the kampong spirit, you know, the old kampong spirit where we help one another, like in a village, where we know each always other. Always starts with food. <laughs> yes, always, yes. Uh, <laughs> but it's not easy. I'm just trying to uh, introduce the idea. I've written to the papers about it, they have published it, right? And I'm trying to get it to sell the idea to our residence com uh, com committee here in the uh, condo. 
just starting with a on small scale, and yet they are worried about legal, uh, you know, implications and things like that. I mean, it's so simple. And I'm always uh, trying to get uh, more daycare. We do not have enough daycare, right? Um, like you know, you you leave your because you're working. A lot of young people are still working, but they cannot leave their parents alone at home. So a daycare would be perfect if you can't get someone to come in. That's pretty expensive, getting home care to come in. So daycare is another, you know, if we can have a lot of, uh, what do you call it? in Malaysia, we said it, tadika. You know, the kindergarten, the daycare for little children, we can do the same for the elderly, but they're not enough, just not enough. So I do not know why there is this huge discrimination. Like it's wonderful to take care of little kids because they're so cute and so adorable. But when it comes to taking care of the elderly, you know, there's a little bit of physical distancing. And that is a pity because uh, from my own experience, my, I went through all, the complete journey with my mom from, you know, early, mild, moderate to the end. She passed away last year at the age of, she could have been, she would have been 95 last uh, October. Right? So the complete 11 years journey with her. Yeah. So it, it, is, it is a pity that, you know, we, we can't get more people to come together. Singapore is wonderful. I learned a lot just studying in Singapore. I, I know one of my uh, memorable visit was to Apex Harmony Lodge. I want to mention this, uh, you know, place because that's where I picked up a lot about therapies as well and how important it is huh, to give them something to engage them mentally. And, and from my own observation, because uh, towards uh, near the last uh, few years, I had no choice but to put my mom in a care center. And I know, you know, Professor Tan, you said, you mentioned about this guilt, you know, this guilt feeling about putting your mom in a home. That happened to me as well. But, you know, it just, sometimes it just no other choice. So when, when she was there, I observed the staff. And I always tell people when they ask me, oh, you know, my elderly father or my elderly mother has got, uh, you know, dementia. Could you recommend a home? And I ha always hesitate. I don't want to recommend because it's so personal. You got to go there yourself and see, you know, observe. I always say, number one, don't go for the frills. Don't go for beautiful fountain, beautiful garden and all that. Go for the care. Look at the staff. How do they interact uh, with the uh, residents there? And at one of the homes that my mom was in, I, I really loved it there. She loved it there as well. There was a lot of physical touching, hugging and kissing and all that, you know, the staff and the elderly. So that is very heartwarming to see. Not many of us, maybe because of our Asian culture, we are not very feely type of person. Yes, we care, but we don't show it. So I think um, they, they, did, they, need, they need that touch. It works. Just want to share that. So I think uh, it's wonderful. You're talking about the the kampung spirit. I think uh, that's why I'm asking whether in a small town, uh, if people know each other, that would be easier to than in a big city. But but, but, the, but that, the kampung spirit can be transplanted anywhere. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> So that, that's why uh, Tingwi has all the nice scones and lasagna from Eileen because Eileen uh, Bygrave came from a small town in Malaysia, Gopeng. She's a Gopeng girl. And and uh, even uh, up Apex Harmony Lodge by Dr. Un, Dr. Un, the KL of Penang girl. Um, so let's get back to uh, Ling Ling. Ling Ling, what are the, find it, what do you find it uplifting? That's the sign of positivity in caring for your aged parents. Eh? Well, I, I think. Um... Because of this common um, issue that we have to face, I think our family comes closer together because you know we have to really discuss things and, and so we have a very vibrant what's, um, WhatsApp chat group among the siblings and, uh, and my, my, my mom as well. So I, I think that's one of the things we should cherish as a family, right? Sometimes there's, a, there's some, some emergency matters, then we all, all come back together. So it's the same as uh, when um, you all talk about how neighbors can also come in to help in emergency um, situations. Um, yeah, but I also want to share that, uh, you know, we talk so much about community. Some people might know that I actually work on Japan, on aging in Japan. So um, I, I work, um, I started my interest on aging, actually looking at intergenerational kind of ways to promote um, connections of the old and the young in institutions. So I've seen like in Japan, you have um, like small group home, like maybe 10 older people 
dementia group home with a little childcare center. So they are all together. And so, you know, every day for the, for the, the persons with dementia, they actually um, enjoy looking at children playing and, and um, just next to them and so forth. And some of this, um, it's, it's not very common, but some places built it because they want to attract staff. Because if you have a childcare place for your staff in the same building, then it's more likely that they want to take up the job, right? So, um, so the childcare children are actually the child, the, the children of the care staff in the place. So I, I thought this is very interesting in the sense of, you know, really um, making use or leveraging on each other's um, mm -hmm. strengths in that sense of how what young children bring to the older adults and how older adults also um, can benefit from that. Yeah, and, and in some places, I remember there are like all kinds of volunteer programs in Japan. So there's one that's called like hugging volunteers. So getting older people to really just hug the children, you know, that sort of, um, of connections. Yeah, so I think we can do a lot more in our community to make, a, uh, to make it a very friendly neighborhood for people with different kinds of um, disabilities. Yeah. Yeah, back to you, Prof Kwa. <laughs> Daniel, you want to um, uh, uh, share with us the, the uplifting moment? I know you, you love your parents so much. Daniel, even whenever I, when I gave two sem uh, lectures in his uh, festival, he brought his parents along, you know, which is wonderful. You know? uh, uh, so Daniel, uh, tell us something about your, your experience, the, the positive part aspect of caring for your parents. I think we're thankful that we did not, we, did, we never had a domestic helper in this whole journey because it allowed me as a child to fully understand um, my parents. So if, if my dad can continue to pour his cup of coffee, why should I take that away from him by getting a helper to, say, to do that for him? Because then he loses his ability to do it. After three months, he'll say, I don't want to do it. After six months, he'll say, I don't know how to do it. After nine months, he'll say, like, what is it? Right? So, so I think the approach, I think the uplifting piece was, is that please spend time with your loved ones observing what they're doing. Because nobody ever teach me, uh, uh, from the clinical setting, yeah, showering is an easy thing, right? But nobody ever teach me to negotiate that relationship when me and daddy enter the toilet together. He will never, never, never let me touch him, no matter how it is, right? But when mommy enters the picture, it's different, it's romance. Yeah? So, so that helps, right? When, when, when we take turns, I mean, I totally agree with, with saying that, look, the healthcare sector needs to, needs to integrate with the community care sector, needs to now integrate with the social care sector, and then now needs to integrate with the home care sector. Because I think four legs definitely always stronger um, than two or three, right? Um, and, and a lot of it really is because of the way I understand Daddy now, I see him, I spend more time with him. I understand what, he, what engages him. And therefore, I mean, we need to develop tools and, tools and tricks that work for us. Uh, it may not work for everybody else. So the, the storybook was, was actually an idea that to actually document his oral history because when he's gone, he's pre-war, right? So he has seen the war. And when he's gone, we lost this piece of oral history. We're only 57 years old anyway. Uh, and, 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 and more so because I realized that if I don't document his history, uh, I will forget, right? He's kind of favorite food. To him, chicken rice is the ball. To me, chicken rice is somebody, something at the hawker center. But to the child, chicken rice could be a cheddar box, $25 chicken rice, right? So, so the same conversation about food, I think that transpires across generations. And, and if I can bring it down as simple as a six-year-old understanding why Kong Kong is forgetting my name, I think I've done justice to the landscape when we leave, when we leave this, this chapter behind us. And I totally agree with what Tingyu is saying is that all of us are this caregiving journey, right? We are current caregivers, we are former caregivers, we are future caregivers, but we, we missed out the part that someday down the road, we'll be persons being cared for by somebody else. So if I don't future-proof my own aging, then what is in it for us when the healthcare system can no longer support our aging? Because for me, I'm a single child, right? And, and, and there's no one else uh, uh, to care other than to, 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 to enroll myself into a healthcare setting beyond, beyond what is said and done. So, so if I can slowly do the upstream preventive piece, I think there's still there's still chance for us uh, to change the landscape by 2050. Yeah. Because I think by then, I'll be assessing the healthcare system uh, 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 then. So I said, hey, little interventions and little things like that, I think could, could help in the preventive side of it. Even before it says that, even before dementia happens, what are the preventive stuff to exercise the brains, right? Like even little rabbit cheese, the gun stuff. It's about eye-hand coordination and all that. So all these things I learned as a kid, but I never really applied it until today. 
And now I'm bringing it back and applying it to daddy mummy. So I get a chance to relive my childhood all over again because uh, I think home interventions, uh, if I can apply it at home, it can scale everywhere else. Yeah. So that's, that's really a supporting thing to caregivers and say that, look, it is doable if you spend enough time with your loved ones um, and understanding what they're really, really like. Mm. Yeah. Thanks. Back to Prof. And it's available on Shopee, right? So if you can look, right. color your memories, we send it across globally. So uh, find it on Shopee and you can, you can get it. Right. All right. I, I enjoy re reading his book. I think wonderful. Uh, Daniel is a, is, a, is a real role model for many caregivers, you know. Um, and um, I, I, there are so many questions here. Did someone ask, uh, are there any medication to, um, to uh, reduce agitation? Yes, there are. It's good for you to talk to your doctors. Uh, because some, but sometimes medication do have some side effects. So we've got to tailor it. Um, um, and someone mentioned about a tripartite. Uh, is it, Go Ka Ching, that, uh, about the, the family, the health, uh, and also the community coming together. I think that's wonderful. I think uh, uh, summarizes what uh, Professor Tan Ting Wee had mentioned. And also I want to thank Ting Wee because he answered all the questions for, for us in the chat box. Yes. And uh, the Ling Ling also been very helpful. And, and all of you have play a big role, uh, Lily and Daniel. And, um, um, I want to, to close with before I close, there are a few things. Um, all this will be uploaded later on to the website of the um, Mind Science Center. And we, I will ask Maureen to help to summarize it. And um, the other thing also, you realize that um, sometimes caregiving itself builds up resilience in, in you. you know? And also it builds up a family, as Ling Ling mentioned, that family comes comes together closely, build up uh, the, the, the solidarity with the family. And, and uh, uh, Daniel mentioned also about the um, storytelling, the family itself, and, and also I think Lily mentioned about that. We have, for many of the seniors, especially those who are fairly educated, we ask them to write the story of their life. For those who are very mild, mild, mild dementia, we call it narrative therapy. And it's very amazing because they tell the stories of the, the, the time when none of us are, were born yet. You know? So it tells interesting stories. Uh, one doctor who was look, who was a uh, look after uh, mentioned about the, the days in, in 1942 when he was a medical student and then he was uh, leaving the, the emergency emergency department of Singapore General Hospital and you know, sometime in December when he looked up the sky he saw Japanese warplanes and it was the beginning of the war and and he uh, mentioned that the, the, the plane dropped about three or four bombs and killed three or four the medical students you know and and, uh, and and the medical history of, of, of Singapore uh, medicine itself, you know, how it moves from Singapore General Hospital to Tan Tok Seng. And for two years, the medical school was at Malacca General Hospital, you know. And it also, the, the children understand more about the, the father and you know, what is life. You know. So the narrative therapy sometimes brings families together. You know? And I'm, I'm sure there's so much more that we can we can we can learn, uh, um, and uh, especially the, the, the community care and services. You know? Because we hope from our, our dementia prevention program, we can reduce the, the, the incidence of dementia. We know that every year in Singapore, there are about 2,000 new cases. If you can reduce by 10%, you save about 200 cases. You know? But some we cannot. Those we cannot, we hope to improve the quality of life, and we need to provide community services and, and, and caring. It's always good to have good neighbors like um, Eileen Bygrave, the third time asking you, uh, mentioning your name, and they'll come to your, to your family, send you uh, scones to your home, you know, wonderful. And, and the families can, and the neighbors can come to help out and, and, and they'll be able to relieve you of some of the, the burden of caring. Yeah. I want That's to thank all the four speakers, uh, wonderful people, and then they've done so much uh, very exemplary, and, and I hope um, uh, Professor Tan Ting Wee will convey the message to the to uh, Mr. Lawrence Wong, uh, the future Prime Minister of Singapore, about our uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the the trials and tribulation of caregivers. You know, I think this, I'm sure he's got good listening ears, and I'm sure you can join him in, in your your band. He he plays the guitar, and I'm sure he'd be wonderful to to have someone who's on our side. Um, I think Maureen has something to announce to us. Um, uh, Maureen, back to you. Uh, should we give the time to Elaine for a while? Because we okay, have- Okay, Elaine. Program. Elaine, has, um, yeah. Elaine uh, is in charge of our Mind Art Experience Lab. 
uh, uh, experiential lab, and she'll tell you very quickly in just two minutes uh, something on dementia prevention that you have here in Singapore over at the uh, Alexandra campus. Elaine, all yours. Thank you, Prof. Kwa. Um, hi, everyone. I love the discussion today, especially looking at the support ecosystems that envelops caregivers and care recipients. Um, I, I'm Elaine and I manage MayLab. So what you see here is our current exhibition. So MayLab is a visual art space that tries to melt transdisciplinary research with ideas of arts and mindfulness. The overall, overall hope of our space is to cultivate a sense of uh, mental wellness. So what you see on the slide that Maureen shared uh, is our inaugural exhibition, Arts, Mindfulness and the Aging Brain. A large part of this exhibition is a feature on the Age Well Everyday program, a program that is uh, holistic and evidence-based and a dementia risk prevention program, a program which uh, Prof Kwa crafted. Uh, we are actually closing the exhibition at the end of May and um, I would love to arrange it for any exhibition tours. Uh, so visitors can book a slot through our appointment form and a virtual tour link, which I will place in the chat right now. Uh, so part of the artworks featured are both the works by the H4 Everyday Program and also some art therapy artworks by the seniors in Montford Care and a Stop Chewing series, which is by a caregiver, Xia Jin Piang, an artist who did a visual arts diary on caring for her, her dementia, her father who has dementia. Yeah. So anyone who would like to book a tour, please let me know. Thank you. Back to Maureen. Okay, so now, uh, since we're nearing the end of the session, let us take a group photo. So if you all will be willing to turn off your cameras and look at your cameras, our team will be taking a few screenshots. So we have something to commemorate this day. Okay, everybody, smile. Catherine, can you please help us and tell us when you're done? I'll be taking page by page. Just give me a moment. A moment. Okay, go into page two already. Okay, wait up. More. There's quite a bit of attendance today, which is great for us. <laughs> Let's read on the next one. Page three. Okay. Okay, so I think the rest uh they did it on the screen, so it's okay, fine. So uh yeah, so all's good. Back to you, Maureen. Okay, thank you for that. So everyone, thank you so much. There was a really informative discussion today and I truly hope that this webinar has given you some answers and some resources to help your caregiving journey. So if you have any more questions and if you want to find out about our programs and also our upcoming events, you can visit our Facebook page and also our website. We also have a mailing list. So if you wish to be in the loop for our upcoming events, please do sign up for it. I think our colleague will be sending all the links through the chat so you can click uh, straight to that. And finally, we would really appreciate if you would be able to fill in this uh, post-event survey. So please scan the QR code or click the link sent by my colleague in the chat. And this will be really helpful for us so we can prepare better events in the future. So I'll just keep this up for some time. So you all can scan the QR code or click the link. So finally, I want I want to thank all the speakers and all of you for participating in, in this webinar. Uh, the next one will sometime be in October or November, and it will be on medications and the elderly. Medicine we take and uh, what are possible side effects and how to how to manage better. Yes. Okay. So thank you so much for coming today. Thank you so much, Prof. Kwa. Thank you so much for our uh, panelists. Uh, Prof Tan Tin Wee, Prof Tang Ling Ling, Ms. Lili Fu, and Mr. Daniel Lim. Everyone, have a great day ahead, and I hope to see you all again in our future events. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend.